The Cheetah Girls 2, also known as The Cheetah Girls 2, went in Spain. This movie came out in 2006, and it is the follow-up to the massive hit, The Cheetah Girls' first movie. Now, I decided to incorporate both, you know, Latino and African American month together because the cast is a mixture of Afro-Latino. And so, first let me also say, look, if you've ever watched my channel, then you know I hate Raven Simone. <laughs> yes, that is the way you say her last name, Simone, not Simone. I've stated many times why I don't like her, mainly because of her views on her own race. Black people know her race is not dark white, as she said. And just the, some of the nasty racist stuff she said about black people over the years, especially when she was on The View. I have decided, just like with the last Cheetah Girl movie, that like, you know, despite my bias towards her, I'm gonna be partial and everything. Like, you know, I'm gonna be fair. Like, I'm not gonna like rip her or degrade her. Um, I'm only gonna base my opinion on her performance in this movie. Some things I will say about her performance is good. Other things I will say is bad, but I'm gonna be fair. I know how to be fair, unlike some of those toxic people like on YouTube and stuff. And so like, you know, and yes, I know she has now stated uh, why she said what she said about black folks back in the day and how people just misunderstood because it was out of context. I ain't buying that crap. It's been over 10 years and she's just now trying to give an explanation. And we all know why, because no major network <laughs> wants her behind right now. And pretty much Disney Channel and Disney is the only people that's hiring her. So she's trying to get in good with black folks because she's trying to get like, you know, deals in other studios. I ain't buying her a little, and it wasn't even an apology. That's the thing, it wasn't even an apology. It was just her saying, I don't know, this is what I really mean. I ain't buying that crap. But as of right now, I will be fair and impartial. So with this movie, this movie decided to be bigger and bolder than that of the first movie. Part of it in the beginning was filmed in actually New or actual New York, where the rest of the movie was in Barcelona, Spain. Disney Channel loves sending their cast to these big exotic places to film their um, TV movies. They did it with Lizzie McGuire when they went to Italy. They did it with Sabrina the Teenage Witch when they went to both Spain and Australia. They did it with Wizards of Waverly Place. They also did it with the Even Stevens cast. And so, you know, this like movie is no different. The visuals, the locations are exquisite. My God! The people of Spain knew how to build some buildings, boy, and some rooms. This movie looks gorgeous and everything it looks very high class but however that is where i have a bit of a problem it's just kind of hokey how they got to spain and why they went to spain and everything um because it's kind of like you know you gotta remember see here's the thing this is a good movie don't get me wrong and this movie is actually the second, oh, well, actually, well, no, wait, it's the first um, highest rated Cheetah Girl movies out of the three. Surpassing that of the first, and of course, ain't nobody thinking about the third. <laughs> and it's actually the eighth, or is it the sixth? I can't remember. I think it's the sixth highest rated, like, Disney Channel, like, original movie. This movie had 8.1 million views, and at the time it was number one, outbeating that of uh, High School Musical and Cadet Kelly. But just one year later, Jump In beat it. Now, this movie has a score of 5 out of 10 on IMDb with 57% Rotten Tomatoes. However, the first movie has a 4 out of 10 IMBD, but 75% on Rotten Tomatoes. Now, this movie was directed by Kenny Ortega, and each movie has a different director. Personally, for me, I prefer that of the first movie. 
The first movie felt more real, it felt more genuine. Also, I liked the songs in the first movie a whole lot better than the second. Don't get me wrong, the songs in the second movie are amazing. They're strong, they're powerful. They, you can just listen to them time and time again, but there's something about the songs in the first movie that are just so catchy, you can't stop listening to them. They stay stuck in your head for decades. And the reason for that is because in the first movie, both movies are musicals, right? But the first one was more pop music, karaoke style music. They had a purpose as to why they sung in the first movie, and they never just broke out in song for the sake of breaking out. Oddly, however, in this second movie, it feels like a Disney animated movie where they just break out in song and dance for absolutely no reason. It's very odd and it's very jarring. And it's just a, such a disconnect from that of the first movie. But when I say I, I like the first one better because it feels more real, you got to remember the time in which we was in, the early 2000s. This cast is um, a mixture of Afro-Latino. You got Raven, who's black. You have Kaylee Williams, who's black. You have Sabrina, who is Latina. And then you have Adrian, who is also Latina, but also Dominican Republic, meaning half black and half Latina and stuff. And this is something very rare to see. And they was in New York and it looked like New York. It felt like New York. You know, there were like subway stations and, you know, dirty looking streets and this and that. The story was more organic and the story Sorry about that, my camera died. But the story is more organic, more unique, and it was more realistic, more believable and everything. Like the story felt so real that, you know, it was about four girls of color who were struggling to be a pop band and they wanted to be the best one they were while, you know, um, starting off their first year of high school and stuff. And, or maybe they was in middle school, I can't remember, but, um, so, you know, and it's so it's like, you know, they was trying their best, just like real bands do. They worked their way up, performing anywhere they could, writing their own music, um, choreographing their own dances, and trying to get their own outfits, all while not being the richest people ever. Um, Dorinda, she is the poorest of the group. And as for, like, I think, what's her name? Um... What did Adrian's character play? Uh, I can't think of her name right now. Chanel, that's it. You can't really tell if she's rich or poor, but I think her mom was struggling with something. I can't remember exactly what it was. And then, of course, you have Gal um, is that Galleria. Um, her family looked like they had money, so they're somewhat middle class. And as for Aqua, we just simply don't know because Aqua's barely in the movie and we don't know much about her and never meet her parents. And so, you know, they was like girls who don't have that much money and trying to do their best to impress people and trying to get like a record deal and stuff like that. And, you know, all while dealing with their own personal issues and stuff. Because the mom had, like, financial issues, I think, with Chanel and stuff. Now, it's like a hokey kind of plot to where Chanel's mom, she finds a rich guy who just happens to live in Spain. Which, I mean, come on, if you're struggling with money and poor, most likely you go and find yourself a sugar daddy. <laughs> And so she's going to have to leave and they don't want her to. And they want to go and visit with her and all this other stuff. And then all of a sudden it's a shooting star. And then the pages in the magazine just happen to flip open. And there's like some type of like festival contest type thing over in Barcelona. And it's just kind of like. Oh, that's convenient. So they enter, they win, and they have to range up a, um, some money because the whole thing's not paid for to fly on out there. And it's just kind of like, how the heck are they supposed to fly and get room and board in Barcelona, Spain? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, because Dorinda is dirt poor and everything. So it would have been nice if we were seeing Dorinda, like, you know, work some extra jobs, get some money and, or somebody to help her out and stuff, you know? 
plus when you go to their home their homes are a bit more fancier now in this movie and the clothes in which they're wearing not their cheetah girl clothes just their regular clothes so they really don't do the whole cheetah girl pattern thing no more and it's just kind of like where did dorinda get the money to dress this nice <laughs> you know what i'm saying so it just felt like the first one just felt more realistic than this movie. It just felt like your typical Disney Channel movie that say, like, hey, you know, here's some like teen girls, put them on some fancy clothes, because that's what Disney Channel loved to do around that time with a lot of their stars, and send them to this big exotic place. Now, in the first movie, the only real actress was that of Raven Simone. Um, the two 3OW girls, Adrian and Kaylee, were singers, and Sabrina was a dancer. So the other three girls like acting wasn't all that great in the first. Now come this time around, it's a whole lot better, I would say. Like Kaylee and Adrian's acting is so much better than that of the first movie. Sabrina's, however, and this pains me to say because I'm a huge Sabrina fan. Like, you know, her dancing, the way she looked, I was head over heels when I first saw her. Her being on Dancing with the Stars. She's a dancer. That's why she was brought in. And she was brought in to be a backup singer. So her acting isn't all that great, which kind of does bog down the scenes that she has because they give her more scenes and more emotional scenes this time around. Whereas in the first movie, even though her acting wasn't that great, I think she did a whole lot better job in the first movie, especially when it came to emotion of not knowing who her parents are, not knowing what her race is, and having her family be like really dirt poor and stuff. It's like they gave her more emotional type stuff and more stuff to do, but for whatever reason, she did not bring it. Then there is Raven. Now, I've always been a fan of Raven singing and her acting because, you know, I used to be a massive fan back in the day. And, you know, she first started with Disney Channel, I think around Xenon, that movie, you know, and she's very charismatic. However, one thing I have noticed this time around, in the first movie, she actually acted and, and you know, she acts the way she does normally and she also acted at it. This movie, however, was a bit odd when it came to her acting because ever since she started doing That So Raven, it seems like she's been stuck as Raven Baxter and that type of acting. It's like she's created this type of persona around her acting to be based on kind of like, you know, um, Raven Baxter and everything. And every once in a while, she will get out of that and do some other stuff. Like, you know, when she left Disney Channel, she had her own show, I think on ABC Family. Not sure how she acted in that because I didn't see it, but it only lasted for one season. But I saw her in that road trip movie, College Road Trip, and she acted like she was acting. But the problem is when she doesn't act like Raven Baxter and she acts a different way, it seems like she, her acting is kind of flat. Then I saw her on Blackish, and she was just acting like her typical grumpy self, like, you know, the, the, those looks that she does, you know. But it was different from that of Raven Baxter. Come this movie and everything, her acting was very childish and everything. She acted like a big kid, very juvenile with the facial expressions, the way she like, um, the way her voice sounded. It's almost like they wanted her to act like her Disney Channel self from That So Raven and also that of Xenon and everything, which is really odd because she's the only person in the entirety of the movie who's acting immature when she just speaks and everything, kind of that cutesy wootsy kind of way, while everybody else is acting more mature. I'm not sure why that is. Now, just like in the first movie, Aqua, Kaylee Williams' character, is barely in the movie. I don't understand why they do that to her for. She barely has any dialogue. She has no character development whatsoever again. And it's like, you know, she just pops in and then she disappears for half of the movie only to pop back in towards the end. And it's the same thing with the first movie. So I don't know why they keep doing that to her. 
we still don't know much nothing about her or her family in the first movie she was a germaphobe and she was really rude when she talked to people in this movie she's a lot nicer but she will get snippy with you but her germaphobia is now all gone and you know one thing that was interesting about the first movie is that you know it's an ensemble cast you know Oh, by the way, Whitney Houston is the one who like produced this movie. Raven actually was an executive producer of this movie and stuff. And so I think so was Debbie Allen. And so like the first movie, even though it's about the Cheetah Girls, it always felt more about Galler Galleria's character first and Chanel second, then um. Dorinda, and of course, nobody thinks about Aqua. <laughs> this time is completely different. Whereas Chanel is front and center as the main person of this movie, Dorinda is second, Galleria is third, but barely a storyline. And then, of course, once again, Aqua is just nowhere to be found. So that it is kind of odd that Raven took a back seat when it came to the character development of this movie, because it's really all about Chanel. It's really like they were trying to propel Ad um, Adrian's character as being like the lead, which of course she took over for the third. Now there could be a reason for this. Now also with this movie, there's no chemistry with Raven and the rest of the girls. There's a reason for that. See, after the first movie, Disney tried to make a real band out of them. So they sent the girls around touring and singing and stuff like that. Missing from the group was Raven because she was doing that. So Raven, the television show. So the three other cheetah girls, you know, they clicked, they bonded. Then here comes the third reel and it was kind of like a clickish type thing, Raven said, that, you know, she just felt like she wasn't a part of, like, the group. And you can tell when you watch this movie when they're all in scenes with each other. Chanel and Galleria don't have any chemistry this movie going around. And, of course, this was the last Cheetah Girl movie they did because there was some arguments behind the scenes between Raven and the rest of the girls. Like I said before, the other girls bonded, they clicked, and now here comes this stranger coming back into the fold and she, they felt disconnected and stuff. And it took a good while, probably like over a decade, a decade and a half, I think, maybe two, for them to all like, you know, bury the hatchet except for one i think it's kaylee's the one who still hasn't really buried the hatchet because she just seems like a bit of a problem when you see this all this gossip stuff online you know what i'm saying but anyways so you don't really feel that strong bond like you did in the first movie like you really felt like they was a group of friends whereas this movie None of them seem like they're friends and stuff because they're all doing this separate thing and they just seem all distant from each other. Now, also, this one thing that also bugged me years ago is that Raven mentioned how Disney Channel got on to her about her weight. Because when you watch this movie, because see, I've never watched this movie before. When it came out years ago, I saw a couple of clips and I just didn't feel like watching it for some reason. It just felt different because of different camera lighting. And I like the camera lighting. It has this warm feeling, it's, but you can feel it's a different atmosphere. So I just didn't feel like watching it. And I just now watched it in August. And I remember back when I saw clips, I noticed Raven was starting to get bigger and stuff. She said years ago that Disney Channel got on to her about that, about her weight and everything, because you know how Disney Channel is. When she was on that so Raven, they also got on her about tanning. They didn't want her to be too dark because Disney Channel don't want to hurt the eyes of white people. <laughs> but you know what? If Disney Channel was going to get on to her about her weight, they should have got on to the other girls too because all the Cheetah girls were starting to gain a little weight by the second movie, except for Kaylee and stuff. And so, like, for me, yes, I do think this is a good movie. It's different. It's big. It's bold. But even though it's different, it's only different because of the atmosphere, because they are in Spain. Oh, 
Side note, did you know America does not consider Spain to be a Hispanic or Latino country, even though they speak Spanish over there? And I have no idea why, because I don't work for the government. But um, it was nice to hear Spanish in the movie because, you know, they are in Spain and everything. But back to it feeling different. Yes, it feels different because of the atmosphere where they're filming. But the movie really feels the same kind of as the first, just twisted around a little bit. Because like in the first movie, the girls wanted to be in the band. They couldn't get along for whatever reason. They turned their back on Galleria and then they came together at the end and became like the Cheetah Girls again. All while going through their same like personal stuff. The mom, um, Chanel's mom was going through like some type of financial thing. Galleria's parents wasn't really going through anything. Um, Dorinda was feeling poor and everything and Aqua was just Aqua. <laughs> and here, once again, you know, you have the drama with Chanel's mom. You have Galleria's mom being a supporting figure who's also now their manager. You have Dorinda still feeling poor and everything and Aqua's just being Aqua. And they all turned their back on Chanel. Oh, Chanel felt left out and they got into an argument and, you know, they kind of like turned their backs on her. And so she wanted to leave and everything because the band was broken up. Similar to that of the first movie. It's literally the same movie, just twisted around a little bit. And I'm a little disappointed in that because with a movie, you're supposed to have character development. You're supposed to have growth and depth and all this other stuff. Putting them in a different location is not character development. And, you know, so I just don't get that because the characters are still acting the same. They're a little bit older because now they're at a junior, um, they're in um, it's their junior year of high school. They're a little bit older, they're slightly more mature, but their personality traits are really still the same and everything. But they do go through some certain different things, like I said before. So, after they head on over to Barcelona, Spain. You know, they're taking in the sights and this and that. Galleria meets Angel. Oh, by the way, it's another love interest for her. Another love interest that doesn't really amount to anything because he's barely in the movie, just like the dude from the first movie. So once again, it's like the literal same thing. Um, they get into like the festival, Galleria wants to like, you know, practice and all that, but the other girls don't, they want to do some other stuff. Whereas Chanel wants to incorporate Spanish into their songs, which Galleria does not want to because none of them speak Spanish except for her. Which is kind of rude on Gal Galleria's part because all the girls don't need to know Spanish, it's just Chanel who actually speaks it. And so the individual storylines that's pretty much going on are. So when it comes to that of Chanel, who seems to be that the main character, her mom, like I said before, fell in love with a rich guy who lives in Spain and they have to go there to visit him and they might have to live over there and stuff. Of course, Chanel doesn't want to do that because, you know, that's not her dad. And just like she doesn't want to leave the band and leave her friends and stuff like that. So when she goes over there, she's not exactly in the best mood. And so she doesn't want to interact with him and his family and this and that. And then at some point in time, she sees her mom is upset because like, you know, the man's not going to like want to marry her, this and that. So then all of a sudden she goes to him and talking about how she's sorry, how she hasn't put her best foot forward and how she didn't try to make this like, you know, pleasant, you know, her experience and all that. And like how I think she's trying to protect her mom from like getting hurt from like another guy or something like that. And so basically those two have like a good understanding and he proposes to her mom and decided they're gonna live in New York. The problem with this storyline is that we do get Chanel's point of view of her not wanting to be there, not wanting to interact, complaining a lot, but we don't get nobody else's point of view. We don't even get the boy, um, her mother's boyfriend point of view 
Like, you know, we don't never get to see him upset. We don't get to see the mom upset. We don't see them argue, talking about how come you can't, like, you know, just be happy for me and this and that. It's literally just a half-written plot to where they both come to, like, an understanding with each other out of, like, nowhere. But we never really truly get to see the boyfriend's point of view. So how do they come to, like, an understanding? Like, you know what I'm saying? It would have been nice to, like, you know, have Chanel tell her mom, oh, you know, this guy did you bad a long time ago. And then remember this guy and that guy. And, like, so we can kind of get, like, where she's coming from and stuff. Other than that, like, you know, her and Galilea aren't really having, or Galleria isn't having, like, a good time because they're just, like, bickering with one another. Because there's another character in here who's kind of like a villain. So Marisol is the new character introduced, and she's from Spain. And she's played by an actress-singer named Belinda School, School, I think that's how you say her last name. Don't know who she is, but she can sing. In fact, she can kind of out sing the cheetah girls and stuff. So to get into this festival, she's always wanted to win and she's come close and she's done it twice. Her mom is the true villain of the movie and everything and tries to sabotage things for like the cheetahs uh, when things don't go her way. So basically she wants her daughter to get close with Chanel and kind of, um, steal Chanel away from the cheetahs and stuff. Now, Galleria's mom can kind of see that there's some kind of shadiness going on with the mom. I'm not sure exactly how she knows that. She just gets a vibe or whatever. And like I said before, like the plot is kind of rushed when you get to these characters and stuff. So, like, because of that, um... Galleria wants to like, you know, practice and perform more, which makes sense because, you know, in a band, you you, you want to practice and stuff. But Chanel doesn't want to because she's too busy hanging out with her new friend and completely blows off that of Galleria. So at some point in time, um, the Cheetah Girls can't perform because only amateurs are supposed to perform at the... Um, the festival and the mother set it up so they can perform at a club, which makes them, I guess, not amateurs or whatever. That don't really make too much sense. Then again, like I said, well, this whole plot don't make sense in the whole movie. So anyways, they're disqualified and they was even given a check by the club um, owner. So because of this, the mom and daughter are at odds with each other. Now, one interesting thing we do see is that the mom forces her daughter to eat a salad while the mom eats like burgers and fries. And whenever the daughter tries to get one, she'll smack her daughter's hand, showing that she's one of those extreme dance mom type people. And she's literally, you know, forcing her daughter to do this and that to be famous. So to trick the cheetah girls, the mom is all like, well, if you add Marisol to your band, then you won't be amateurs no uh, then you won't be professionals no more and you'll be amateurs. They're already amateurs and everything. They haven't made it big. So I don't understand like what's going on. But anyways, so the daughter doesn't want to do it and doesn't want to perform. Again a little bit later. Dorinda is spending all her time with this guy who's like a dance instructor and she's going to help teach and everything. Now, the dances that they're doing are, you know, like really like Spanish type dancing, like, you know, the tango and stuff like that. And how exactly she knows those dance routines is beyond me, but she's supposed to be like the best of the best dancer in the entire movie. And yes, Sabrina can dance. Boy, I love watching her dance on um, Dancing with the Stars. And so, like, at one point, her love interest, see, he's the nephew of Chanel's mother's boyfriend. And so, like, because of that, she thinks he has money. When he has a bunch of his friends and other people, 
he does not introduce her to them. This pisses her off and she assumes that he's ashamed of her because she's poor. How exactly does he know she's poor? Maybe she told him. Maybe I over like didn't hear that part, but whatever. So she is pissed and just goes off. But then later on in the movie, he's all like, I'm poor too and everything. I just couldn't afford to take you to the restaurant, blah, blah. So of course she believes him, but then she was shocked because, you know, he's related to what's his name and what's his name is really rich. But just because you're in the family don't mean you get to share the wealth. So it was nice to see her have like a storyline that wasn't whatever it was in the first movie. <laughs> but, it, but it had to be one of those love interest type storylines, you know what I'm saying? Aqua's Aqua and really just don't do nothing. She literally again has no storyline. However, she will be given one in the third movie, but it's a love interest storyline. Then there's Galleria, which I am surprised she has little to do in this movie, especially since Raven is a co-executive producer. And so just like in the first movie, she is, you know, her and her band can't get along. She wants them to practice. They don't want to. And it's weird that none of them wants to because they're off doing their own little thing. Now, it makes sense for them to practice, like I said. What don't make sense is her reaction. She decides, you know what? I'm done. I'm going to catch a train to Paris and meet my dad. She just literally gives up just because they don't want to practice and everything. And I'm just kind of like, what happened to your big dream of making it big and all this and that? As the leader of the band, she should have got them in shape and told them, like, look, we're going to do this, this and that, whether you want to or not. She's not a really good leader if she can't even motivate her team to do one simple thing like to practice. Instead, she wants to flee to Paris. What the world kind of storyline is that? <laughs> but of course, when they find out she left at the scene, she didn't even say bye. She just left them a note. So of course, they find out what train station she's at. They stop her, and now she's back in the band. Seriously, when you stop and really analyze this movie, this movie don't make no sense. <laughs> because then, and back with the whole Marisol thing, the girls decided, hey, look, you know, whatever. We can't have you be in our band because you don't know our stuff and you only speak Spanish. Now, she also speaks English. She could have literally just did like a background thing. But of course, you know, her mom's scheming. So they decided, you know what? The Cheetah Girls need to be represented. So they have Chanel sing along with her. But then all of a sudden, Chanel, of course, doesn't want to do that. Makes sense. And then so the Cheetah Girls perform anyways. When they perform, this is what don't make no sense. So, okay, well, actually, before I get in, let me get into Angel. So, Angel is barely in the movie, just like the love interest in the first movie. Now, what's odd about this is that he is the love interest of that of Galleria, just like the dude from the first movie. Now, Dorinda kisses her guy, but you never ever see Galleria kisses her guy. And that's one reason because they're barely in the movie and they barely interact. One of the reasons why this could be is just because Raven is a lesbian and she just probably just doesn't want to kiss a guy. Which if that is the case, they shouldn't even write that in the movie that she has a love interest. Give it to one of the other girls. And so because of this, once again, she has two love interests from two different movies that don't amount to absolutely nothing. It is a pointless storyline, but just like in the first movie, he helps the band out. When he overhears that the mom is the one who got them the gig at the club and they took the check, you know, to get paid and stuff, he ratted her out. And he ratted her out to his dad or uncle, who happens to be the festival owner and everything. Everything's all tied together. And so because of that, he helps the band out and they get to perform. Now, here's the problem when they get to perform. They're performing like always, and they're really dolled up in like Spain-type clothes. Really fancy Spain-type clothes, you know? 
They don't look like the cheetah girls whatsoever. And that's another thing. They have stripped their personalities in the way they dress away. The only time they ever dress like the cheetah girl one time in the movie. And that was early on in the beginning. And so when they perform, all of a sudden now they're asking Marcel to join the band and perform with them. But what was all that hoopla before about, oh, she can't join us because she don't know our lyrics and she only, I only sing Spanish and everything. Now all of a sudden they letting her sing with the band and everything's all cozy. So what was all that crap before? And then not only that, but then here come people in the audience on stage joining them, dancing and singing along because this isn't, because this is literally a musical now a big production number where everybody just sings and dance for no apparent reason. Ugh, I just don't get that, you know? It's just like, I like the vibe of the first movie more where they had a reason as to why they broke out in song and dance because they was literally performing for people. Here, they just break out in song and dance for like the heck of it. And so like, you know, um, the movie ends with them like, oh my God, y'all so special, blah, 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 and stuff like that. And it's just kind of weird, like I said, how they got there, but nothing is even more weirder until you get to the third movie. And you know, it is a shame that Raven had to leave because as much as I don't like her, this project really needed her. Like she is part of the Cheetah Girls, you know what I'm saying? And you know, I'm really surprised like how her career didn't take off like most other stars and everything. Because the thing about her is that she can act, she can sing her butt off, and she can dance. I'm surprised, that's a, that's a triple threat right there. Like she should have been bigger than what she was. But the problem is when it does come to her acting, ever, like I said, ever since she joined Disney Channel, she only has one range of acting she doesn't have a broad range anymore it's like almost like she's stuck in a rut and can't get out of that disney channel type of acting because when she does try to get out of it then her acting looks off and bland and everything like that and you know when it comes to her singing why is she not a bigger star when it comes to singing? Like, I am shocked because, you know, Disney Channel always tries to make, like, singers out of their stars. And they tried with her. But when they tried with her, they made her sing bubblegum pop type music. Because so I remember one of her music videos came out. And I'm just like, why is she singing this juvenile type show? Like, it's bubblegum pop. And the thing is, is like when it comes to say like Selena Gomez and Hilary Duff, now I like them as actresses and stuff, but I've always hated their singing. And with Miley Cyrus, you know, it's like, you know, it's been a while since I heard her. So I don't, like, there's one song of hers I like, but I've never really been a fan either. But I'm surprised because they became huge music stars and yet Raven did not for some bizarre reason. And when it comes to my all favorite, like, you know, Disney Channel, like, singer, oh, it's Demi Lovato all the way. Because she has, like, multitude of range with her voice when it comes to singing. But I'm just so shocked and surprised that Raven never became a bigger singer than what she was. Same with Annalise um, Vanderpoel, who played Chelsea in That So Raven. She can really sing and hit some high notes. But when Disney Channel tried to make her a music star... I did not like that video that they put out in their thing. And, you know, I'm so shocked and surprised Raven has not won a Disney Legends Award yet. I'm actually shocked that Miley got one before she did. Granted, Hannah Montana was a beast on his own and it was huge and everything. So I get that reason. But, you know... Raven was, like, I think the first Disney Channel star to be an executive producer on a Disney Channel project. That was a first because nowadays you see that all the time. Like Miranda May, who plays Lou, she was an executive producer on Bunked in the later seasons. 
Uh, what's her name? What's her name? Um, Selena Gomez and David Henry, they're now executive producers on the Wizards of Waverly Place spinoff series. And Debbie Ryan, she was a producer on Jesse, and not only that, but she co-created the show. So nowadays you see that, but back in the day of the early 2000s, you did not. And Raven was literally one of the first people to do that. Plus that so Raven was a huge show and it broke the mold of Disney Channel, allowing it to go past 65 episodes and changing its intro per season. Yet, for some bizarre reason, she never got a Disney um, Legends Award. Now, Disney Channel is working with her currently to make other spin-off shows and like shows she can co-create, which is another reason why she probably tried to clear up some of the stuff she said about black people, because of course these spinoffs are gonna be starring black folks in them, like the um, first one that's about to come out, and black folks gotta actually watch it, but if they're pissed off at her, most likely they probably won't. Because she has said some really foul things about her own race, because she's just a very ignorant and disgusting type person. Now I said I was gonna be nice, but that was early on when reviewing the movie. I ain't reviewing the movie now. Now I'm just reviewing her. <laughs> and she can't say, oh, that was in the past. That was like over 10 years ago when I bad mouth black folks because earlier this year or last year, she put out another statement talking about her now wife back when they used to date back in the day they broke up and Raven said the reason why they broke up is because black folks were looking at them. Now what that guy do with anything? What does that guy do with anything? Well, they probably staring because one, she's famous and two, they probably didn't know she's a lesbian and everything. But why are you gonna break? So it's it like who broke up with who? Was it her who broke up with her then girlfriend? Or was it the girlfriend who happens to be white that broke up with her because black folks were staring at them? Like, which is it? Who is the actual racist here? You know what I'm saying? Like, seriously, she has a problem with her own race. Talking about she's dark white. Man, whatever. And it's like, why reveal that? Why reveal that you and your then girlfriend, who's now your wife back when y'all was dating, why did y'all break up because black people was staring at you? Like, why reveal that? Why? Like, what was the point in revealing that? Like, and it was like something earlier this year or last year. Like, why reveal that? So of course, with her still working for Disney, they're kind of like, yeah, you know what? You're probably rubbing people the wrong way and you need to clear clarify some things. Like the whole not wanting to hire a person because they have a black ghetto sounding name. Mm -hmm. There's a reason why that hair is blonde. <laughs> There's a reason why she dyed her hair blonde. Talking about she's dark white. <laughs> All right, I'll talk to you later. Bye.